Welcome to the Revolution in Ideology program. I'm Nick. Jared. This is our second episode in a series of episodes on Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man, where we will be discussing the irrationality of rational society. So if you haven't listened or watched the first episode of this series, I highly recommend that you do so. Um, We go through a short bio of Marcuse and why this book was important, um, both at the time and still to this day. And then we go through his use of the term technology, which is kind of unique. And then uh, further, his term advanced industrial society, which he uses throughout the book and kind of what he means by that. And then we talk about the totalitarianism of advanced industrial society, which is crucial to understanding Marcuse's thought. Um, So like we said, we're going to today talk about another idea that Marcuse has in One Dimensional Man, which is the irrationality of rational society. You'll remember from the first episode we discussed um, his uses of technology. He uses technology as a social process. It is the ways in which the specific items of technology are applied. And he says as a result of this, every system of technology has inherent values, ethical and moral statements, and so forth, and so that we as a society get these things from the way that technics, the specific items of technology, are applied. As a result, so much of our society, if not all of it, is dictated by this idea of rationality, this pursuit of applying specific items of technology in the pursuit of profit and efficiency and so forth productivity yeah yeah the, these these cute little catch words that everyone has sat through a meeting at some point in their life mm-hmm. and heard Synergy. these yeah these words are extremely loaded terms and not necessarily loaded for the benefit of the individual nor even benefit for, of, of the techniques themselves but benefit of a certain type of discourse mm-hmm. and perpetuation of that discourse and i think there's two uh sort of ideas outside of Marcuse that i would encourage people to check out we have an episode on Max Weber's concept of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. And so much of this way of thinking comes out of um, the Protestant ethic and Weber's theories there. So Which is interesting to think about, like Marcuse being more of a materialist, Weber being more Mm -hmm. of an idealist and that that kind of synthesis. And they do. There is a reflexive relationship between Mm -hmm. the two. So I actually argue that Marcuse is more idealist than traditional Marxists are, but that's a whole other thing. His focus on psychoanalysis and so Uh, forth. Okay, I can see it. Um, The other thing that I think that's really interesting is this concept concept of Taylorism. Do you know what Taylorism is? No, tell me. So Taylorism is, it's often commonly referred to as scientific management, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but it's this. It's named after, I think his first name was Frederick Taylor, if I remember correctly. I don't remember his I was thinking name. of a guy like like sewing my clothes, but okay. No, like his ta- name was Taylor. Like you're tailoring no. something. I thought, yeah. no, I really thought yeah. that's what it was. No, okay. his name was Taylor. Okay. So he comes up with this idea of applying basically science to, this is in like industrialization, right? to like the worker and to management and so forth. So it's ideas like how much literally can a man lift before he gets too tired? And so they would measure like workers and like, okay, he can lift this amount of weight for four hours before he's done and tired for the day. If he lifts it for three hours, then he can, you know, all this stuff. If he lifts a quarter of the weight, then he can lift it for six hours. So to maximize production and so forth, we should have each man only ever carrying this amount for this many hours, and then they can work the full work day, and it will maximize production and profitability of the company. Gross. That's like an example that I just yeah, made Yeah, gross. That's many a, people yeah. attribute this to Henry Ford. Fordism is also a term that goes in right. line with here, like the assembly line and so forth. As far as I think I know through the research I've done, they've ne- they never actually crossed paths. They sort of developed independently. They were during the same era for the most part. Um, but anyways, Taylorism is this popular thing. I'm going to point people towards an episode. I'm going to look it up real fast so I can get the title right. Uh, I already have the tab up. But there's a really good podcast called The General Intellect Unit that's like a leftist, socialist, po- anti-capitalist podcast that talks about technology and all kinds of interesting things. But they, uh, the first time I ever heard of Taylorism, I was listening to an episode, it's number 49 of theirs, called Organizing for Power. And it's a two-part series they do um, where they talk about tangentially sort of Taylorism. And it's super, super interesting. So check that out. That's episode number 49 of the General Intellect Unit and 50. Um, and we'll link to that in the show notes. Um, but it's just like that kind of thinking, right? This rational thinking and applying it to human be every aspect of 
human society from the production of goods and distribution of goods and political systems, our ethical and moral uh, systems and so forth. The way that we behave and think is completely dictated uh, mm -hmm. rationally, thinking about rationality and the pursuit of specifically profit and efficiency and production and so forth. That's the synthesis, of course, of other ideologies we've talked about in other episodes, right? The synthesis of post-enlightenment positivism under like capitalism and how that applies into industrialism. And you can kind of see that synthesis mm -hmm. right there, right? Like there's even a little bit of nationalism, believe it or not, sprinkle it in as you want to measure your nation's like value you by mm -hmm. how you apply your positivist yeah. or capitalist um, applications. Yeah, no, that's super Apply important. your applications. Well, I yeah. Don't yeah. No, and Marcuse talks about positivist thinking, like Compton and so forth. That's actually really important. And we have episodes on that uh, as well, positivism and neo-positivism and so forth. So check those out as well. So I don't think anyone would probably disagree like furiously with the first part of Marcuse's assessment, which is that our society is completely dictated by this uh, way of thought, which is one of the ways for Marcuse that it is totalitarian, this advanced industrial society. The second part of this thought, though, is that thinking like that is wholly irrational. Um, and this is where our students struggle a lot of times to figure out how it's possible that if we think in everything rationally, how can that possibly result in something that is irrational? Well, let's talk about right, that. Right. Like Mar I have the numbers, I have the graphs, I have the charts, I have, or in, in my field of history, I have my cited sources and mm -hmm. they're all peer revered and so on and so forth. And all of these things like are applied. And I think, right, like, and, and again, it's super controversial because we're not like trying to debunk like, like research and things along those lines. But the fact that that research is linear and that linearity is usually attached to things like profit motive, efficiency, and productivity that's what makes it totalitarian right mm -hmm. so i think there's two ways sort of that it's irrational the first is in the outcome right the outcome itself is irrational which we'll give some specific examples of in a second and second the means through which it achieves these outcomes is also irrational so let's do the first one first the means themselves are irrational and marcuse argues that through this totalitarian pursuit of efficiency and productivity and profit it results in oppression, which is completely irrational. The oppression of human potential, the oppression of potential freedoms, and so forth. So through this absolutely strict positivist rational thinking, we end up oppressing ourselves. And we end up leading ourselves further and further away from like the maximization of human potential. And I don't mean potential in the productive sense, which is what the whole critique is. I mean potential in the creative and sort of the free Social, sense. cultural, so, like exactly. any other sense besides like the profit or productivity or efficiency sense. Right. Um, which again, for, for me, are absolutely just dirty words. Yeah. Right. Like human beings, and, and I'm probably going to modernize this more than, than Marcuse uh, could because he was writing in the 60s, but like human beings were not meant to spend 50 to 70 hours a week in a cubicle filling out Excel spreadsheets, right? Exactly. That is self-oppression. Mm -hmm. That is self-oppression. Nor were they meant to sit on an assembly line for that amount of hours doing the same right. menial work. No, were, no and, and we can even take it down to like the smallest, like youngest level. Like kindergartners are not meant to be in like these, 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 these rooms that are designed by people that also design prisons oftentimes and shut the windows out and have like short, like 15 minute recesses every once in a while, but only if they're good and they stand in line and do, mm -hmm. basically they're taught, they're taught to be obedient so that they can work well within this like totalitarian yep. system, right? Like follow directions, walk in a line, color inside the lines. Like yeah. th 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 this is it, right? That's the totalitarianism mm -hmm. of, of the system in this case of advanced yeah. industrial society. I guarantee that someone completely was, irrational. Someone was definitely filling out spreadsheets in a cubicle in Mark Hughes's day for sure. Right. I also think about the fact that he worked for the U.S. government for like a decade, so he saw this like firsthand. I guarantee he saw people in a cubicle filling out spreadsheets, probably like, layers upon layers yeah. of irrational misery, and mm -hmm. it, it it bears itself out right now. Like no, one need look no further than like of course the 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 political partisanship we're seeing. Right. People are like trying to find any sort of outlet to to really release their anger and their frustration with their daily lives. One need look no further with the fact that like, uh, I don't know what percentage of the population is on some sort of drug from nicotine to alcohol, mm -hmm. to tobacco, to Xanax, to THC. I don't know if I already named that mm -hmm. to like how many drugs, energy drinks, how many drugs do we have to take just to get through our day? Right. And again, I'm counting like even like, like soft drugs, like caffeine, but like Coffee, that's yeah. like a healthy a healthy society does not require this much drug use just to make it through its Completely day. Completely irrational. Right? Yeah, that is yeah. that is evidence of irrationality. Not right? to mention, like, 
the absolute mental health crisis that we're dealing with now with like right. such high percentages of people being clinically diagnosed with some form of depression or anxiety or some other kind of mental illness like the fact that that is a result of the rational society in which we live is completely irrational the manufacture of deviance right we've already used this in other episodes but most people that most of our listeners are aware like the united states specifically has more people in, incarcerated than any civilization in human history mm -hmm. and that why are all those people in prison they're not all like rapists and murderers obviously so like we the manufacture of deviance right because because the, certain people will not follow like all that is required of them in an advanced industrial society or mm -hmm. will and, and again maybe they're doing this like consciously maybe they're doing this subconsciously doesn't matter manufacture of deviance is also like evidence of a wholly irrational society exactly so the means through which this society is irrational right oppression etc let's talk about the outcome we kind of have bled over right the outcome is rampant drug use it's mental illness um but that's just the outcome on us as individuals let's talk about another very serious one which i think is the most obvious example which jared uses in class extensively is the impact of this rational pursuit of profit and efficiency and so forth on the natural environment what kind of moronic species actually like works its way to its own demise, right? That is not a biological imperative of any species. It is really not. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, even like, you know, the, the various species that like die after they, they, they give birth or whatever, octopus or whatever, like, mm -hmm. like the, they, they've still completed their task. The species human, as a whole still yeah, exists. Yeah. Yes. The human beings are, uh, there's one planet. Like I get that we can, and, and this is part of like that critique as well. Like the rational society is, well, we're just going to go to Mars or Titan or whatever, the moon or whatever. No, you cannot tech your continue to technology your way out of these behaviors. You cannot keep doing it, right? The colonizers back in the 1400s realized this, right? Mm -hmm. Easter Islanders realized this. What is it? Rapa Nui's, that's what it's actually called. But like people yeah. realize it. We have not learned that because we're completely irrational. You cannot have an economic system based on like perpetual growth on a finite system of resources, i.e. the earth. That is an impossibility. It is what we would call irrational and yet we're watching it happen we're aware of it kind of like on the periphery like climate change or like we're going to run out of oil or uh, um, ocean ocean acidification or reef bleach coral reef bleaching or like what's going on in the arctic with the ice and now the, like and all of the different layers of like interconnectivity that are breaking down because of our actions but we keep doing those actions and most people, at least in advanced industrial society, solution is to stay the course and tech our way out of it. Yep. Like buying a Prius, like, oh, the technology will leave. No, a Tesla or a Prius or a whatever, a Nissan Leaf, that, that is the absolute last thing on earth that would actually save the earth. Yeah. And yet we continue to do, why? Like what? And what, that's, what's that's a saying? hugely important point of this. We'll talk about this more when we get to the episode. I can go on and on, on but I'm, I'm not going to bore our listeners with me, like, you know, uh, critiquing we everything. Can, but... We'll go into more in depth of this when we get to his solution uh, in our final and fourth episode in the series. But he says that, I like what you talked about, how, like, we cannot technology our way out of this. Like, Marcuse says that's not a thing because all of the things that we invent and create and so forth, the companies that we come up with and, like, all these ideas that we have – are a result of our way of thinking and behaving that has been indoctrinated into us in this very specific system of technology that is rooted in exploitation and the pursuit of profit uh, to all ends and so forth. So there's no kind of technology that can be invented out of the current technological system that will save us from the current technological system. That's just right. not possible. Right. So, like a Ford F-150 now is no different than a Model T of 100 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, it does its job, its specific job more efficiently, but it's still the same technology. It's the same technique right. because that technique was developed under these dominant discourses. Mm -hmm. So we can't have... You know, it's not inventive. Marcuse uses these terms, which are very important, right? Quantitative and qualitative. We can't have a quantitative increase in technology to save us from the technological system. So what I mean by that is we can't have an increase, we can't have more technology of the same that will save us from the system, that we need a qualitative change 
in the technology, the social system, in order to free us from the irrationality of this rational society. On a micro level, uh, especially people of, of our age, if we if we date ourselves a little bit, like think about how much time was spent, I don't know, a few decades ago, like engaging with your tools and your technology versus how much time was, and it's gone up, right? Like mm -hmm. before you would end up at the mechanic every once in a while or the DMV because that tool needed that time. But now it's like you're at the phone store. Now you're at the computer store. Now you're on the phone with IT somewhere in, in Mumbai for all we know mm -hmm. like then you also go home and you have to be on the Xbox or the PS4 or whatever with the uh, for, to watch Netflix or YouTube or whatever like that is that's totalitarian and none of these technologies are novel that's I think the point we're trying to make they're mere improvements to techniques that already exist under the dominant discourse mm -hmm which makes them, in our opinion, wholly irrational because then there's no further like development outside of this very linear path. They're quantitative changes, not, not qualitative. qualitative. Right, exactly. Another example that Marcuse talks about briefly about the irrationality of rationality is bureaucracy and administration right. in advanced industrial society. If you've ever engaged with a bureaucracy of any kind, which every single person has, whether it's the government or like your university or whatever, right? Just think of like the DMV and how completely, I want to say like TPS reports, right? <laughs> like completely irrational it is. Like say you go to the DMV and you forgot your insurance, right? And so they won't, at least in Colorado, you can't register your car. You can't get a new driver's license and so forth. Got to go back home, go through the process again. Like that exactly. is completely irrational. Or has anyone ever called, I don't know, Xfinity or uh, Time Warner Cable or mm -hmm. any, like that, that in and of itself, like how much time and energy and emotional energy is put into engaging in that for what purpose? So, but I want to stress- Which is wildly I, irrational. Cost-benefit analysis would dictate that is a wildly irrational behavior, and yet we do it. I love this as an example because it's both, it exemplifies both the rationality and the irrationality because from the perspective of the bureaucracy, it's fully irrational, right? So we have these call queue systems, and like as a result, we can hire less uh, call center employees, and we can record the conversations and analyze them, and we can put them in this spreadsheet that will see how efficient people are, and how this, per this person saved this percentage of accounts from cancellation and so forth. And like, that's why that system exists. Yeah. But for the end user and for society overall, it's wholly irrational that we have to spend so much of our time doing this. Even for the automaton bean counter now, that that jack in, in, in the, what is that? The accounting department mm -hmm. at Xfinity or Time Warner or whatever like straw man I want to pull down here. It's irrational for them to, it might be rational specific to their job at Xfinity or Time Warner, but the minute they themselves have to engage in this with like let's say their homeowners insurance company and have to do this all of a sudden but they where's that cognitive dissonance they don't yeah. realize that they are perpetuating this process even when they're irrationally engaging it with somebody else well somebody. And i would argue that the employee actually realizes it that probably everyone involved realizes it but that's how it's totalitarian you can't do anything about it right mm. if you've ever had an entry-level job say you work at a call center you've guarantee have sat there and been like this step that i have to do seems completely ridiculous and irrational why do i have to do this but you're a whole powerless to do anything about it right if you've ever gone to your boss and be like hey boss this thing that I just did I know I've only been here for a week but it seems wholly irrational and would probably be better if we did it this way what's your boss say he's not like oh thank you new employee you revolutionized <laughs> our system here's a promotion that absolutely does not happen right the answer is usually well that's just the way we have to do it right it's the irrationality of rationality and everyone in the and system is And do not powerless. question the process or my me, my 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 marginal authority. Right, because the process Further totalitarianism. Itself, yeah. The process itself is the absolute authority. Right. Right? And no human person there's not an individual that controls the process. It's this sort of abstract thing like, well, we must we must follow the process. If you want to hit your sales numbers, you have to follow the process, the process, the process. The process is sort of the abstract deity, and that's wholly irrational, but it exists within a rational society, and it exists to serve rationality in the increase in production and efficiency. It's and taken so over forth. everything. I sports yeah. with the uh, the analytics movement. Like, no, it's, 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 yeah, Perfect it's taking example. over everything. Yeah, statistics and so on. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. Everything is measurable. Mm -hmm. All right. That does it for this episode. This was our second in the series on Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. The next one we will be discussing the ways in which man is one dimensional 
in advanced industrial society. And we'll be talking about both what that looks like and how it came into being through the concept that Marcuse coins called repressive desublimation. So this is a little more of his psychoanalysis, uh, his contribution here. He also talks about art and high culture and how the critical functions of those things over time has been completely eliminated and assimilated into mainstream society. So that's really, really interesting. Um, find us online, revolutionandideology.com. We are on Twitter, at Rev and Ideology. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, like the video and make a comment. If you're listening to it on a podcast app, give us a rating and share us with your friends. If you really like what we're doing, you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash revolution and ideology. I'm Nick. Jared. Later.